everyone, Sammy from Ketchup, back to business for this new edition of the Hyper Games Conference. As usual, very happy to be here to discuss the latest trends of the industry. Your feedback on our previous sessions were very, very motivating, so thank you for that. And I hope you'll enjoy your presentation of the day. And let's start with a quick fact. Hyper casual is getting more mature. Market growth is slowing down, competition remains super intense, and breakthrough innovation tends to become more difficult to achieve. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to tell you that this is it, we've reached the end of the hyper-casual road. This is just totally natural. After seven years of market existence, it's probably just a new state of play to which we need to adapt. And this adaptation implies, well, obviously, to continuously look for new trends, as well as to make our games deeper, to reach higher LTVs. But these are big words that I'm pretty sure you've already heard. So today the idea is really to introduce you to a very practical example of how you can tackle these challenges. This is, of course, not the only way, but it might hopefully inspire you and give you some tools to prioritize the right things on your next project. Now, by definition, HC games tend to appeal to the broadest possible audience. But what if there was also a space for a slightly less mass market but more engaging experience? What if it was possible to generate between 100k and 200k dollars of profits out of these games that you wouldn't have considered? Well, that's our point and we've had, we have an interesting story to tell on this side. So let's start where any game starts, at the ideation phase, which is probably the most underrated step of any HC games creation. Of course, we need to move fast. To avoid copycats, to not miss the time to market opportunity. But if there's one phase that we shouldn't rush, it's the ideation one. The more time you spend on the ideation, the more you reduce the risks to make your prototype an instant kill, actually. So by spending a bit more time here, you can actually save a lot of it later on. And at this stage, it usually all starts with an idea, whether it's from a TikTok video or from a game loop of an old console game, a trendy series, you'll have this concept in mind that you'll want to turn into an HC game. And this is exactly where you shouldn't rush right away to production. On the contrary, this is where it's always important to take a step back and to clearly deconstruct your idea to better know where you're going to move next. So actually, we recommend you to clarify at least the six coming points to understand how you will move further later on. First, what is the best genre to bring this idea to life? Quick reminder, in theory, we can push the HC business model to any classic mobile game genre, but in practice, there are six main HC genres that cover 99% of the released HC games. On one side, you have the three most mass market ones, Runners, Light Puzzle, and Simulation, with more than 80% of the total HC downloads. And on the other one, the, let's say, niche genres that usually appeal to smaller but more engaged audience. And of course, you can also uh, try to hyper casualize new genres, high risk, high reward. It is doable. Remember that. The simulation genre was not even a thing in 2019, so it is possible, just a nice challenge, let's say. Second, what would be the best three Cs to showcase your ID? Here, the combinations are endless, but if the topic interests you, I invite you to check our last videos on the three Cs in Hyper Casual, available on the HGC YouTube channel. Then, what would be the best theme to, to fit your ID. Sometimes your ID is directly linked to a specific theme. Sometimes you could stick any theme on it. In that case, what should it be? Just know that the top three themes in terms of downloads in 21 in Hyper Casual are Fashion and Makeup, Criminal vs. Cop, and because we are still in the HC industry, Neutral. Then, what will be your core mechanic? There are can actually be more than one, a main mechanic and the secondary ones, or many secondary ones, as we see very often nowadays in runners, with, for example, uh, currently a runner combining stacking and choice making. 
then you have the, the, the art question what will your game look like and finally there are some technical challenges that you might want to overcome to make your game even shinier uh, can be nice fluids technology using more subtle advanced haptic feedbacks face recognition any new tech that could bring add an innovative factor to your game now that these points are covered you should ask yourself where will the wow effect come from what will make users on tiktok stop scrolling to download my game and more specifically it's always interesting to check for each of these six points where do you innovate where will you follow a trend and where will you go proven now this was the theory I promised you this presentation would be more practical, so let's jump to our concrete example. This example is based on Crowd Defense, one of our last releases, and the point of this presentation will be to show you how we built this project. At this time, beginning of March 2021, many mid-core slash hardcore mobile games were using this kind of creatives. Endless waves of enemies, strong tower defense vibes, very masculine settings, if you've played a mobile game at this time, well, I'm pretty sure you've seen at least one of those ads. But as with the pull the pin trends previously, the content showcased in these ads most of the time wasn't really included in the final games. So that was mainly a CPI breaking move from the publishers of these games, meaning that there was a user acquisition appeal behind those. So that's where we started, actually. Then, let's reuse our six pillars previously mentioned. On the general side, hyper-casualizing tower defense has always been a challenge. Because these games usually are at least mid-core, as they imply strategy, resource, resource management, long and relatively difficult levels. So that's why we decided to avoid these obstacles by mixing it mixing the tower defense DNA with the aim game shooter core that we see more in hyper casual. On the three C's, we went for a safe trend following approach as back then first person shooter were really trendy in uh, hyper casual. With the theme question, it was a bit more complex, let's say, because we have a few examples of military themed games that worked in hyper casual but we also know that this is by nature let's say a relatively niche kind of theme so yeah then on the mechanics we were used mostly proven mechanics with a strong focus on the weapon in level switch we really wanted to have during the level the opportunity to change to, to switch between the different weapons that you might have it's also something that was uh, proven on the market. On the art side, we followed the trend, the current trend back then, which was uh, to go with semi-realistic weapon. And most importantly, and this is where we wanted the wow effect to come from, we used Unity Dots to generate the massive crowds that we wanted to reproduce, which was quite innovative back then. And that's how Crowd Defense was born. After two weeks of production, we tested a first version with only three weapons and 10 levels on the stores. Uh, actually, it was on the App Store. And the results, especially in-game, were actually very solid already, which is great because great engagement metrics with low content in-game means that your core loop is already quite deep. So very good signal here. And naturally, we decided to iterate on this project and our key advice at this stage would be iterate on the core promise of your game which implies first to understand the core value of your game and to understand the main players motivational drivers what why are they coming back to your game why do they enjoy playing it and one key advice to start here always start with improving your core. Too often, we tend to rush to more variety, more content, before the core is even solid enough. 
actually just improving your progression curve by adapting the difficulty making the game's rules easier to understand with for example a better tutorial can make a huge difference and this is actually what we did uh, and what we chose to do on crowd defense a few funnels optimization a better onboarding and a change in the first weapons we unlocked in the game um, during the first test, we started with the cannon, we decided to run an A-B test, and actually the fact that we started with the Gotling showed that yeah, it was the favorite weapon for the players from quite far. Once the core gameplay is more solid, comes the question of more variety. And here I mean valuable variety, because variety for the sake of variety, if it's only a question of cosmetic, well, it often has a very limited impact on the game's KPIs. So no, here I'm really talking about variety that creates new situations, implies new behaviors for the players, variety that basically generates depth. So we went for this with more enemies offering unique behaviors. You can see the dynamite guys, uh, the, fast, the fast horse riding guys, the flying enemies, the mid-boss, the mid-bosses with shields, the titan bosses. In addition to that, we brought new allies as well as new weapons to the game, each of them offering, of course, unique abilities, but also a unique visual look. So, for example, you have the, the archers, uh, allies, you have towers helping you, you have flamethrower, airstrike, each of these have to offer a very juicy visual feedback as well as a unique in-game impact. It was very important so that this diversity actually creates depth because, well, it forces the players to choose their approach to get rid of the enemies in the most efficient ways. For example, small tips here, do not uh, try to use the landmines to get rid of flying enemies. And in the end, all these elements with their unique visual signature and direct gameplay impact allowed us to reach our go-to-launch metrics. So these metrics come from the version, including the ads. And as you can see, it's already quite solid. Now, updating your game doesn't stop at the game's worldwide release. And especially with relatively niche -er and deeper games that tend to be slow burners in terms of UA, it makes sense to keep on enriching the game's content. And what's cool after launch is that you can actually count on numerous players' reviews to help you move to the right direction. Here, for example, one of the most common requests in the reviews was to increase the game's challenge. Of course, the idea is not to screw all the balancing of the game, which is actually one of the main reasons uh, why the game has great in-game metrics, but adding an endless mode is a nice way to make both worlds happy. The most engaged players who asked for it, and the others who can just decide to pass if they're not interested. This feature will land uh, very soon in our next big update, so we are really exciting, excited to, to see the results. Stay tuned for more info on this. Finally, when I say iterate on your core promise, it is true with the gameplay and game content, but it is also very important on the creative side. Experimenting with creatives should be a continuous process all along the testing phase. It should also be radical. Don't hesitate to go for ambitious changes when you try to break your CPI. Here, for example, you can see a few of our uh, attempts, a few of our experiments with, for example, more, realistics, uh, more realistic visuals. Didn't work at all. With girlier approach, let's say, didn't work either. Or with more creative approach, like with the dinosaurs, which actually became one of our best creative. But our all-time best creative is this one, quite classic. Uh, before scaling, it reached 33 cents CPI. And as you can see, well, it perfectly highlights the core game's promise. In a few seconds, you understand 
what the game is all about. You have this wow effect coming from the crowd, the super juicy effects from the air strike bombing. This is our best. Now, as you may have understood, crowd defense isn't exactly the definition of the most mainstream hyper casual game. Because of its genre, because of its gameplay, it appeals to 90% of male more engaged audience than your typical FC game, but also more niche. And this means that your CPIs will more quickly rise during the scaling, but also that your players can monetize better. So with these types of game, you should get creative with your monetization strategy, and especially on the rewarded video placements. And speaking of RV placements, the in-level placements tend to remain very rare, whereas they have a big potential. In Crowd Defense, we implemented two of them. First one is an in-level temporary power-up. You can slow down your enemies, activate a bonus airstrike to clean the map or get unlimited ammo. You have a few seconds to, to click on it, so you generate also some time pressure. And the second one is a nin level flying chest. As you can see on the screenshot on the right, when you destroy the chest, you get a nice gift pop-up locked behind the RV. In-game, in crowd defense, we have over 15 different RV placements. And these two ones represent 17% of the total RV watched. So not exactly useless, as you can see. Then, just a quick reminder on the skills selection wheels, Archero style, they are still a super efficient way to trigger RVs. Because they tend to generate a try them all effect, they exploit the curiosity of our players, and they thus can bring many interesting RV placements, either with the reroll option that you can see on the screenshot uh, on, the, on the left if you're not satisfied with what you just got, or to choose a second one against a, a video, an ad, and or as in the third one, you just basically don't have enough money to buy both upgrades unless you watch your RV to, to unlock them both. So yeah, you can get very creative here, and as you can see, results are quite interesting too, to say the least. Finally, for the RVs, Meta features can also bring very interesting results as well. Here I can mention our weapon shop and its uh, weapons upgrades. Each of the 12 weapons we have in the game are upgradable nine times. And yeah, you can improve them either with money, but it's becoming expensive quite quickly. So the other option is to upgrade them against a RV. This is also where you can uh, select the premium skins for each weapon that you will unlock in classic RVs, like the chess room, for example. And the, let's say, second interesting meta feature that we brought is the world map. Not only it can tease potential interesting content, but it's also a nice way to push for RV boosts. As you can see on the picture here, you can double the revenues in the in the coming uh, minutes of your games, or you could unlock some specific locations locked behind RVs on the map, for example. So yeah, meta features, nice RV boosters. And finally, one last word about your inter strategy. In HC, there's, let's say, a classic way of showcasing interstitials. You win a level, arrive to the windscreen, which in crowd defense looks like this, where you can decide to watch your RV, here a tap timing multiplier, and if you decide to not watch this RV, well, you have an interstitial popping. This is both very classic and quite efficient. But as you may know, there's a new trend where the inter actually pops up before the win page. In theory, this method can improve your LTV because some users will watch both inter and the RV after. So we decided to A-B test this. And actually, well, the results were quite bad with the second option 
because users were already watching the inter, they were way less inclined to watch the RV after, so the percentage of users watching the RV declined significantly, hurting the LTV. In addition, since users were systematically shown an inter, when they usually don't see it, when they've watched the RV, the churn rate actually increased compared to the classic situation, hurting a bit more the retention and thus the LTV. So the lesson here is that you can't really copy-paste the monetization strategy from one game to the other. Depending on your game's stickiness, depending on the success of its different ARV placements, its session playtime, you can and actually must adjust your strategy by running your own tests and optimization. And that's it for today, guys. It was my last advice. I hope you find it uh, interesting. Thanks again for your support. Do not hesitate to ping me on LinkedIn or in Pine if you want to have a chat. Always happy to discuss current market trends or your own studios, situation, or any topic related to hypercasual. And yeah, stay tuned for more content from our site. Enjoy the rest of the event.